Station 10? Do we have a Station 10? Let's take a look. Should be right over there. Hi. Hi. My name is Dexter Ang. I'm from Stafford, Virginia. Uh, I'm 30 years old, and I'm wondering what my life will be like in a few years, let alone 50 years from now. My question for both Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger is, how do you think you've changed over the last 50 years? And if you could communicate to yourself 50 years ago, what would you tell them? One piece of advice, business or personal, and how would you do it in a way where your former self would actually heed it? Charlie, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Incidentally, I'll trade you places, so don't worry about your future. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're basically so old-fashioned that it, it, we're boringly trite. We think you ought to keep plugging along and stay rational and stay energetic and just all the old virtues still work. And, uh, but find what you turned on. No. Yeah, you gotta, you got to work where you're turned on. I don't know about Warren, but I have never succeeded to any great extent in something I didn't like doing. Charlie and I both started in the same grocery store. And neither one of us are in the grocery business. <laughs> we were not going to be promoted either, and you, even though you had the family name. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather was right, too. <laughs> oh, it, it's really, I mean, if you're lucky, and Charlie and I were lucky in this respect, we, we well, we were lucky to be in this country to start with, but we, 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 we found things we liked to do very early in life, and then we, you know, we, we pushed very hard in doing those things. But we were enjoying it while we while we did it. We have had so much fun running Berkshire. I mean, it's it's almost sinful. And and uh, but we were lucky to, you know, my my dad happened to be in a business that he didn't find very interesting, but I found very interesting. And so when I would go down on Saturday, there were a lot of books to read, and you know, it. Uh, it just flowed from a very early age, and and Charlie found he found it. You found a way to atone by your for your sins be, and having so much fun. You're giving all the money back. Oh, well, yeah, but you give it all back whether you want to or not. In the end, no, no, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Becky. Uh, this question comes from Lawrence Anderson in Dublin, Ireland, and. He asks, what factors have enabled Berkshire's insurance pricing policy to stay so rational while also being a very sizable market participant? In insurance, was that? In insurance, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would say this. I, I really do think that Berkshire is an unusually rational place. I mean, we, we know what we want to accomplish. Uh, we've had the benefit of a very, very long run, and we've had the benefit of a whether you can argue whether it was a benefit or not, but of a controlling shareholder, so we did not have outside influences that pushed us in directions that that we didn't want to go. So, uh, you know, insurance uh, should be conducted as a rational activity, and it, one of the problems that some insurers have had is that they would have a pressure for increasing premium volume every year brought upon by by Wall Street. You know, very few, we actually contracted the business written by National Indemnity, our, formerly our main business, its traditional business. I think we contracted it probably by 80% or something of the sort when, when the business became less attractive. I, I'm not sure any manager of a public company that was answering to quarterly earnings calls and that sort of thing, I'm not sure whether they really could have stood up to the kind of pressure that they would receive if they'd followed a similar policy. We have no, if we do something stupid, it's because we did something stupid. It's not, it, 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 no external factors are pressing on us. And uh, that's a great way to operate. And it'll continue to be the way they operate. Most people, uh, if you own a half of 1% of the company or less, you know, and and other people are doing things that Wall Street is applauding and you're not doing them, it can be very hard to, uh, to resist. And uh, 
you know, you respond to media criticism and all kinds of things that we don't have, we don't have to do it. And uh, uh, there's no reason for us to do anything stupid in insurance. You get offered a lot of opportunities to do things that are stupid. We were major writers of catastrophe, natural catastrophe insurance in the United States some years ago uh, when the prices were right. We don't think the prices are right now, so we don't write it. Uh, we haven't left the market, the market left us. And, uh, but we are not about to do something where we get paid 90 cents for running, the, running uh, a probabilistic loss of a dollar. It just doesn't make any sense and we won't do it. And we don't put any pressure on anybody to do it and their incomes are not dependent on doing it. So it, uh, it, it's not hard to be rational with Berkshire, Charlie. Yeah, there are pressures on other people that we don't want and therefore don't have. It is very hard to shrink an insurance operation by 80% when the people who come in every day don't have enough to do and it, it, it's just, it's, it's a counterintuitive thing to do, but it's absolutely required that you do it in a place where people go as crazy as they do in insurance. Yeah. Well, um, it's like um, buying internet stocks, you know, in the, in the late 1990s. I mean, the, all around you, you have these people that have high IQs and they're doing it and they're being successful. And so, you know, everybody from, from your, you know, your spouse to your employer to the press says, you know, how can all these other people, how come you think you're so smart, you know, avoiding this when everybody else is doing it and they're making a lot of money? And, and, and of course, it creates this social proof where uh, uh, it works for a while. That, that's the great danger period in, in, all, in all of these bubbles is that, is that what starts out with skepticism ends up with your neighbor getting richer than you are because uh, uh, he went along and you didn't. And, that sort of thing, the bandwagon effect and everything, those things are very hard to resist. But we don't have any pressures to do that sort of thing. I mean, we just don't give a damn, you know, and that, that uh, uh, we don't necessarily think we're smarter than the other person on that. We just think we don't understand what it's all about. And if they can make a lot of money, you know, day trading or whatever it may be, you know, good luck to them. But we're not, we're not envious of them, but we certainly are not going to do it just because they're doing it. Charlie, any more than that? Oh. I always say there's a reason why all that stuff is in the Bible. You can't covet your neighbor's ass or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were having trouble with envy a long time ago. And it's a perfectly terrible thing to do. And how much fun can you have being envious? We always say it's the the so one sin there's no fun in. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Gluttony is a lot of fun. <laughs> Lust has its place too, but we won't get into that. Cliff? <laughs> I think it would be great if you would publish the portfolio statements of the puppet partnership years. I think there are a lot of small investors that would get a kick out of knowing, you know, what you invested and how, how you went ahead and um, analyzed the companies. Thank you. Yeah, well, Charlie, Charlie ran something called Wheeler Munger, and uh, his portfolio was even more interesting. So we'll start with you, uh, Charlie. <laughs> well, <laughs> he ran a more concentrated portfolio than I did in those days. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think people would be greatly helped. You wouldn't recognize the names, most of them, of the early Buffett partnership. You'd recognize American Express, but they're rattle off some of the names. Yeah, well, we can start with Mosaic Tile and, and uh, uh, the map Meadow, Meadow River Coal and Land. <laughs> there's, there's hundreds of them. Uh, Flag Utica, Total Life and Running, Coal and Iron, you name it. Uh, I've literally owned, I bet I've owned four or 500 names at one time or another, but most of the money's been made in about 10 of them. <laughs> The, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I couldn't name ten books either that have, that I regard as that much better than the next ten. My mind is a blend of so many books I can't even sort it out anymore. Mm. 
yeah, well, the intelligent investor changed my life in terms of, I had, I literally had read every book in the Alma Public Library by the time I was 11 on the subject of investing. Uh, and there were a lot of books, and there were, a lot, there were technical books, Edwards and McGee, I mean, that was a classic in those days, and a whole bunch of them, Garfield drew. But, uh, and I loved, I enjoyed reading them a lot. Some of them I read more than once. But I never developed a philosophy about it. I, had, I, I enjoyed it. I charted stocks. I did all that sort of thing. Uh, Graham's book uh, gave me a philosophy, a bedrock philosophy on investing that made sense. I mean, he taught me how to think about a stock. He taught me how to think about the stock market. And he taught me that the market was there not not to instruct me, but to serve me. And he used that Mr. famous Mr. Market example. He, he taught me to think about stocks as pieces of businesses rather than ticker symbols or things that, you know, you could charter or something of the sort. And so it was that philosophy uh, and in some way uh, further influenced by Phil Fisher's book. And, which, and Phil Fisher was just telling me the same thing that Charlie was telling me, which was that it's very important to get into a business that had fundamentally good economics and one that you could ride with for decades rather than one where you had to go from flower to flower every day. Uh, and those, that philosophy has carried me along. Now, I've learned different ways of applying it over the years, and, but it's the way I think about businesses now. I, 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 I'm, I have not found any aspect of that bedrock philosophy that, that, that has flaws in it. At, uh, you have to learn how to apply in different ways. Um, so those, those are the books that, that influenced me. And of course, in other arenas, Charlie, and Charlie's probably read more biography than anybody that I, I know of. Uh, uh, and I like to read a lot of it. We just got through reading the, the Joe Kennedy biography. You, you've read that, haven't you now, Charlie? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure you want to emulate everything he did, but, but it's still no, interesting no. reading. <laughs> This is, uh, we read for the enjoyment of it. I mean, it's been enormously beneficial to us, but the reason we read is that it's, that it's fun. And, uh, you know, it, it's still fun. And uh, uh, on top of it, we, got, we have gotten very substantial benefits from it. Uh, my life would have been different if, I, if Ben Graham hadn't gone to the trouble of writing a book, which he had no financial need to do at all. You know, I, I would have had a very different life. <laughs>